Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Young and Dynamic. Uh, it is a pleasure to see you all again today on a Saturday. Um, I welcome you all, Dynamite and HLF staff and our executives connected everywhere and around the globe. I'm Salome, I'll be your MC for the day. I'll be taking you to the meeting. Uh, we jump onto our housekeeping rules. Uh, make sure you have a notebook and a pen like me or anywhere you could write. And also be reminded to ensure your gadget is on mute, unless if you're asked to speak by the facilitators. Uh, in case you're leaving the meeting briefly, kindly switch off your camera and then you switch it back on in the back. Be also reminded that you have a chat box below your screen that you can use either to post your questions and any other information you'd like to, to answer for you to you want your leaders to answer. Um, anyways, uh, can we have a recap of last week's meeting? Feel free to enter what you learned in the chat box. Uh, we have a team. We have a team that will be going through and answering all your questions and seeing through what we learned in, in last week. Uh, okay. Uh, in this, while we post our our lessons for last week. I would like to give this opportunity to Governor Shelton, who's going to be leading us in the prayer segment. Over to you, Governor. Thank you. Good afternoon. I will take this opportunity to pray. Thank you, our Lord, Father. Now, let's uh, pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jehovah. Thank you, God. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for looking over us for protecting us, for being with us. Thank you, Father, for developing us into people who we are today. I want to thank you, Father, for the opportunities that you continuously bless us with. I want to thank you for this beautiful family. I want to thank you for this beautiful meeting that we're going to have today, Father. Please be with us. Please be with our souls. Guide us and protect us through the whole meeting. Father, please open our minds. Allow us to learn. Father, we thank you for Doc, who is here today to teach us, to share with us all the things that could help us in life, Father. I thank you for that. We thank you for that, Father. Father, we've been uh, using our Lift Up Africa campaign prayer. And uh, Father, you said in Isaiah 5, verse 26, that you will lift up, lift up a, flag, a flag to the nations that are far away. Father, we are waiting for you to lift up the flag for us, Father. Please, Father, be with us, guide and protect us, Father. We thank you for this beautiful meeting. We thank you for these beautiful people. We thank you for our leaders who are continuously here for us, giving us the opportunities that we would have never got by ourselves. For us, so Father, we thank you for being here. We thank you. We ask you for your presence in this prayer, in this meeting, Father. We ask for your presence. Touch each and every one of us from the presenters to the audience that are in the room. Father, we thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you, Governor. Uh, anyways, we go back, go back to our meeting. So today we're going to be having a session with Dr. Frederick Mandiriza. He's a high-performing, award-winning CEO, a business leader, and international business consultant. He's an expert in the digital transformation in industry 401, digital labor and jobs for the future. Uh, Dr. Fred has over 30 years of experience in uh, skilled human capital development, organizational transformation, and industrial deep change leadership. He also has solid experience in advanced R&D in drug discovery, development, and deployment among African populations. Dr. Fred, authored and published three books in, cyber, in the cyber physical system, covering a wide range of emerging technologies for Africa leadership. He is passionate about empowering, empowering 21st century blue ocean design thinkers, smart innovators, and digital inventors. Currently, he is the managing partner and CEO for the Legacy Building Leaders, LBL. He's a certified international professional strategist CIPS, a certified international professional leader, CIPL, and is the most decorated distinguished fellow 
of Cambridge Global Learning UK. He holds a Doctor of Business Administration specializing in 21st century disruptive technology. I'll, I'll leave this time to Dr. Thank you. The over to you, Dr. Thank you, Salam. It's my pleasure once more to be with you uh, this, um, this afternoon. Um, yeah, last week we had um, an interesting discussion and I believe uh, quite a number of you had uh, one or two things to pick up and learn from. Um, this week, we are taking this um, a conversation to the next level. And we will start by um, looking at the definition of uh, if education 5.0. And after that, we will then proceed to looking at the solutions that we, we do have um, as proposals from, from our end. Uh, let me share my screen uh, now. Please confirm if you are all uh, listening to and hearing what I'm saying. Yes, Dr. Yo. Thank you. Let me see my my slide are you in a position to see my slides now you're not yet not visible it's not visible not yet okay let me try and uh, you're sharing the computer sound thing sorry about that uh, This is usually uh, what happens when you are using uh, somebody's uh, gadget, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Are we set to go? Yeah, can you see my screen now? Yes, you can see your screen. Wonderful. That's good. <laughs> So yes, um, our discussion, conversation is uh, to do with the issue of uh, African education. The last week we we're looking at the landscape. We looked at the critical issues that are affecting uh, our institutions of higher learning, particularly the issue of um, um, the design of the curriculum uh, its impact on uh, development of relevant uh, competencies, as well as the issue of capacitating our young people for trans transforming our continent. And we saw that uh, Education 5.0, um, which is what we call a heritage-based Education 5.0 model as a critical solution to the current challenges that uh, the African continent is facing. So it, it has become also uh, important, therefore, to define a little bit further into this issue called the heritage based and the issue of education 5.0. We are looking at issues that have to do with the wiring of our mindsets, the rewiring of our mindsets. Because as we develop uh, academically, our mindsets tend to be wired in a particular way, to think in a particular manner, and that determines the way in which one responds to uh, difficulties or challenges of life. Bearing in mind that life is all about dealing, handling, and solving 
a, a, a complex problems that we face in life. So if we've got some challenges, it means we have to deal with them and we have to solve problems that are associated with that. But the seed of solutions is the mind. Yeah, and that mind is governed by a, a number of factors which tend to formulate what we call the mindset. So the mindset is one that is fed by a number of issues, among them societal uh, arrangements, uh, cultural arrangements, but critical among those is the issue of the type of education, the curriculum that one uh, uh, is, um, is, is guided through to formulate that uh, um, uh, mindset. So, yeah, last week we also saw that um, there's need to create an abundance uh, perspective, an innovate, innovative uh, or solutions perspective, a possibility perspective, a digital perspective, among other critical perspectives, which are very important in terms of solving problems. Why is that important? Uh, it's critical because as Africa and uh, uh, citizens in this uh, continent, we face a myriad of problems, challenges that require our solutions. So young people, uh, you have your current problems today. And, and please don't allow some people to say your future is where you belong to. You belong to the current environment now. And, and there are problems which require your attention to solve and then also to be ready for those that will come tomorrow. And yeah, so let's look at what this thing called uh, Education 5.0 is, uh, is all about. So you understand that we call it heritage-based uh, education 5.0. So the component which talks about heritage is actually looking at the uh, resources that we have uh, in abundance as, as the African continent. We do have um, uh, perhaps over 65% of uh, untapped biodiversity on the African continent. We also have huge deposits in terms of minerals which are found underground we have huge forests, we have uh, huge uh, animals, number of animals. We have um, a critical among those. We also have our own um, uh, uh, human capacity as Africans. And when we collect all that, we, we identify what we call our heritage. We also look at what we call our posterity the things that we can then say these, we have been able to maintain them, keep them, uh, we've been good stewards, and now we want to pass them over to the next generation. That's our posterity. So our responsibility as human beings is to make sure that we create value around this heritage uh, by making use of it, extracting it, adding value to it, and then being able to pass it on to the next generation. That's where we are saying our education system, particularly the higher uh, education system, must base its competency development and the skills that we know and the high or superior knowledge that we create, it must be based on the heritage that we have as Africans because that's what we have as Africans, and that's what we can add value to. That's what we can also um, work on to produce products and services, which allow us then to compete at a global stage. Um, we have one continent. We have um, uh, those that are in Zimbabwe, we have one country. Those that are in, in, in Lesotho, they have also one country. So that which belongs to them, which is seated in their country, is their heritage, their natural resources, their posterity, which they should be able to, to, 
to translate and transform into products and services for competitive advantage at global level. Therefore, Education 5.0 aims to focus on that particular element. Then let's look at the component of Education 5.0 itself. Education 5.0 by definition is um, uh, actually in an education system that is anchored on five key pillars. And, and these pillars are then uh, um, probably looked at from two different angles. The first set looks at the teaching, research, community service, innovation, and industrialization. So when we have education 5.0 being uh, deployed in our institutions of higher learning, it is expected that our lecturers should understand the foundational issues to do with the type of teaching which must, under, which must uh, be undertaken uh, in order to achieve specific goals set by and for uh, our system of education. The same applies to research. Uh, what type of research are we conducting? Does it really focus on solving our own African problems or it's um, a, a foreign influence to try and focus on problems that have nothing to do with us or is something else? The same uh, in, uh, when we look at community service. How are we embarking on community service uh, projects and activities? Whose agenda are they driving? The same applies to innovation and industrialization. So these are the key issues that, that um, Education 5.0 do uh, uh, um, uh, 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 focus on. Then the second uh, uh, dimension is where we look at the fifth generation, <coughs> excuse me, the fifth generation technology, 5G. So 5.0 represents the five pillars and which are these five pillars, but it also represents 5G technology. Why 5G technology? We are simply saying the kind of education that we have created for ourselves as Africans is focusing on the next generation of technologies. It's anchored on the fifth generation of technology. We are not yet there. It means we are futuristic. It means um, we are preparing our young people through this model of education to be able to move into the future, not just with confidence, but with the capability and ability to make use of the resources which are available for them um, and, and be able to thrive, be able to succeed and prosper, create a, a, a wealth, making use of our own a, a heritage. And, and that's the agenda we are looking at. So, under this particular uh, element, we have five key issues that we look at. The first one is that Education 5.0 uh, provides a radical cut off and, and a clear defiance of foreign uh, um, designed and influential higher education system. We want to cut off from a, a foreign influenced education systems because they do have their own agenda. For example, any education system that was given the African uh, during the slave uh, uh, trade, it was focused on uh, making sure that they get uh, um, uh, uh, pliable to uh, uh, enslavement. In the same, when it comes to the issue of uh, imperialism, colonialism, and even apartheid, all those types of education systems were meant to serve the purposes and agendas of those who crafted them. Because look, if the truth be said, uh, usually when any education system is being crafted and designed, there are people who sit around the table and say, what are the objectives we want to pursue? And they define the kind of uh, objectives they want to pursue the strategy and then the content of that education system and uh, all the other issues then fall into uh, um, a line with what they have designed. So we want to cut off from that. 
Then the second aspect is heritage-based superior knowledge. This education model is saying we want to create a superior set of knowledge which has its roots into our um, heritage. For instance, um, last week we, we were talking about uh, Zimbabwe being the fifth largest producer of Libya. One would want to say, what are the key competencies that we produce in our institutions of higher learning, which make sure that we can then create value out of the lithium which is being processed and mined locally. If, for example, government has now said there is no a, a lithium ore which is supposed to be exported from out, out, outside Zimbabwe, do we have the competencies, the superior kind of knowledge and the know-how to be able to work on the raw uh, material and transform it into some usable uh, extract from it. That's the key thing that our institutions of higher learning should now focus on, okay? And then the, the third one is resilience into the augmented future. This resilience we are talking about is that once we create an education system which uh, taps into future technologies, but also looking at the prior or what we call the, uh, the legacy technologies. It means we are building in resilience, a resilience in the, in the form of uh, the capability to work on it and to develop the competence that are required and create new jobs or jobs of the future, to create also markets of the future, and also to position our young population for excellence uh, into that future. So it's key that we have that. And we are talking about an augmented uh, future, meaning a, a highly connected future where the internet uh, becomes what we call the internet of everything. Everything gets connected. There's nothing that remains unconnected to the internet. It's an augmented type of um, a future. And that's very key. Then the fourth one, we're looking at the African youths uh, being prolific in terms of innovation and invention. So there are two things here. The issue of innovation, being able to come up with new products which have never been developed anywhere. Our minds have got the capability to do that. Never be fooled by anyone who says, an African or a black man cannot invent anything. That's, that's a blue lie. And last week we saw also a list of black people who managed to innovate a lot of things. And, and, and then uh, and invention, you are also looking at these two key issues as how best can we change the systems, structures and whatever which exists now to be able to get superior products and services, and how best can we also create new ones which have never been produced anywhere? We are capable of doing that. Then the last part, but not least, is that it focuses on genuine economic independence. Unless our continent and our countries produce superior knowledge, which is linked to our heritage, it becomes import, Im, impossible to gain genuine economic independence. And I want to repeat this, unless we develop superior knowledge through research and development to be able to invent and innovate, we can never acquire genuine economic independence. So why is it like that? It's because owning any a, a means of production on its own does not translate into products and services. And I think history attests to that. Uh, we have acquired various types of means of production, inclusive uh, the land, um, but not many of us have been able to transform that into real wealth, yeah, substantive wealth. Uh, which can be called generational wealth, 
to be able to pass it on to the next uh, generation. We have not been able to do that. Why? Because we have not acquired, we have not created superior knowledge anchored on that means of production. If you've got land, you must create superior knowledge of how to manage the land, how to make use of it, how to extract value, and to know the real basic ingredients within that piece of land and say it can be uh, extracted in this format, we can package the value in this particular format, and it, solve, it solves these problems which are demanded uh, out there globally. And then we compete globally using uh, those uh, solutions uh, per se. So it, it becomes important for our institutions of higher learning to focus on that, uh, for our young people to acquire a genuine independence, uh, so to speak. Then we are also saying our future uh, is really uh, um, solved by a number of actions that we need to take today. And these are the proposals that we, we are bringing over to you as young people, as young Africans. Number one, it is digital mind shifting through lifelong learning. And lifelong learning is a key component of the 21st century era. It is a key tool that is used to equip our minds to uh, create new knowledge and also to make sure that our minds are prepared to uh, uh, not only acquire the new knowledge, but also to make use of the knowledge for purposes of research, for purposes of uh, in innovation, for purposes of invention, and also for purposes of solving problems, complex problems bringing solutions to the world. Because look, you are the only one that the world has been waiting for up to now. And if your brain, your mind does disappear from the earth without it having been applied to produce a particular solution, it means the whole world is lost and generations to come will have lost. So the challenge is now upon you and I to say, how responsible are we to make use of the resources that we have and to create solutions, some of them which are sustainable into the future? You just don't want to grace uh, this particular earth as a problem and disappear from the face of the earth. You must be known for solutions which you have created, okay? And we do have a lot of uh, uh, resources for that. So um, in order to undertake this mind shifting I'm talking about, it is important to, to know that there are massive resources which are available online, but it's not all knowledge which is available online, which is useful. You need to customize it. You need to con contextualize it. You need also to align it with our heritage. Now, if you think of a, any company that you can set up in this, in this country or in this con on this continent, um, uh, it must be aligned with the heritage that we have, the resources that we have. There are no two ways about that. So I have, I have also challenged the old adage which says knowledge is power. And I'm saying, no, knowledge is no longer power. But wise application of knowledge is power. I can even go further to say wise application of superior knowledge is power. Because those that are uh, out there, that the, the countries that are considered to be uh, leaders of this world, those that dominate, uh, they do so on the basis of superior knowledge and nothing else. It's not about just the political power. Political power is subservient to the superior knowledge that they have. So uh, those that have superior knowledge can also acquire superior political power uh, at global level. So in the future, data and digital knowledge or digital superior or superior digital knowledge are going to be the currency 
uh, which no one would be able to dispense of. You can't do away with data, can't do away with digital knowledge. So the challenge is now for you to look at uh, uh, sources of this data and digital knowledge and be able to apply it uh, for purposes of uh, creating your future. And then innovation and invention okay within digital ecosystems. Yeah, this is what is happening. When we talk about the 5.0 uh, component, we are saying is the digital ecosystem. And therefore innovation and invention will okay in those um, uh, environments when we go into the future. Then our minds need to be wired for digital expression, digital thinking, digital solutions, digital application. Uh, we must be prepared for that. So now at MBL, we have developed um, what we call the LLP, which is the lifelong learning platform. This lifelong, lifelong learning platform is available um, uh, uh, to provide access to the cutting edge resources and knowledge in any particular area. If you think of big data, data, data analytics, you think of IoT, you think of a blockchain technology, you think of uh, conversational artificial intelligence, uh, uh, you name them, uh, you can have access to them. And that's the solution we have provided as an entity to the world. And, and we think if young people have access to this particular solution, then we are a step towards uh, solving uh, the problem that uh, Africa ha has. The second one, is what we also refer to as the heritage based education 5.0 model master classes. Uh, we have come up with a set of master classes which are available uh, for enrollment uh, so that one can go through these programs and for purposes of mind shifting. But not just that, it's a game changer type of uh, uh, thinking and, and mindset. It enables you to see the world differently and to be able to say, I can do certain things in this world. Certainly I might not be able to do everything and, and, and uh, uh, replace others, but I can play my part. I can do my uh, own responsibility given my purpose for life. So it, it equips you for that particular purpose. So we have the different modules, which we looked at last week uh, and we saw that there are uh, 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 six of these modules. Then it also uh, helps you to uh, uh, deliberately create a digital ecosystems um, where you can take part in. Because the world is all about digital ecosystems. Uh, if you want to stay stuck in the analog era, I will repeat what I said last week, you are then setting yourself for big failure in the 21st century, not only that, but you are setting yourself up uh, as the best candidate for extinction. There's no doubt about that. We want people who think digitally, uh, not that we are saying get addicted to technology and get consumed by it, but make sure that you, you are relevant because there is digital DNA which runs into young people uh, of this uh, particular generation and, and those of the future. Nobody can run away from that. So these masterclasses uh, serve the purpose of uh, assisting uh, in that particular process. So you influence others also, you can influence others to enroll for this uh, Education 5.0 masterclass program and, and make sure that you transform yourself and transform others for that particular a purpose. The third aspect is uh, the issue of um, getting yourself uh, connected to future tech mentoring programs. There are several of these uh, future tech uh, uh, mentoring programs. Uh, certainly from our end, we have not yet been able to do this one, but there is nothing that stops us from a, a find collaborations and work on that and put it in place. But not only that, but we can also be able to um, collaborate with existing partners. We have already developed certain networks of some sort 
and bring in this particular component of a future tech mentorship, uh, which is very, very key uh, for preparation of the young people uh, for the future. And enrolling into that uh, um, arrangement creates what we call a critical mass of future tech leaders. Because what we want going into the future are critical digital thinkers. Yeah, what I call blue ocean uh, digital thinkers who themselves are tech savvy, but also making sure that they, they want to influence others to create a critical mass Mass, a critical mass of young people who can make a difference wherever they are. And this is what we are talking about. Uh, and then you provide uh, that leadership uh, uh, mentorship. The fourth as aspect is the, uh, the Africa Digital Innovation Teaching Factory movement uh, in colleges and universities. Again, this uh, brings in some new components in terms of STEM and innovation for purposes of now preparing our young people for the hands-on approach to uh, uh, factory creation, industry uh, development, new products and, and uh, services development and, and so on and so forth. So that we cease to have young people who wait for some other people to create companies and jobs for them. Nobody is going to create companies and jobs for you. You must be able to say, I am in a position to create my company, my job, and secure the jobs for others. Okay, so you can also focus on this one. At the moment, we are currently working on this one at the early stages of it. And uh, Surely, if we do have partners who are willing to uh, do the networking, we are willing to, because we do have the, the content already in place, we can do that and help our continent to move forward. Okay, so teams could be able to, to work on that, defining the issues that are um, uh, critical for innovation and invention. And also, when you talk about industrialization, um, what are the issues that you must look at? What is the content that you must look at? So these are the issues that you grapple with under this particular uh, teaching factory uh, concept. Yeah, so that's the fourth aspect which we propose to uh, young people. Um, and this one is just a throwback to what we looked at, uh, just to reconfirm that Black people uh, are innovators and inventors and they produce uh, life-changing solutions. I've just picked on Black Afro-American inventors, uh, but we do have others in Africa. We also have others elsewhere, and that's important. You can be one of those that can stand uh, uh, on the shoulders of these giants and be able to see a brighter future, which you can create. And there's nothing that stops you from doing that as long as you apply your mind, as long as you also do your, undergo your mind shifting and prepare yourself for that. It's a process and you need to, to get committed to it. Um, yeah, let me conclude by probably just reiterate that we all have a role to play, but most importantly, each individual must develop the commitment and the drive to say, before I leave this earth, I must make an impact on different lives. I must also create a, a posterity legacy for the future. Um, we were not just born and created to be uh, nobodies on earth and live without anything tangible that we leave behind, that people can ascribe to our names. No. So the commitment is up to you and up to uh, myself to, to know that um, we have a role and responsibility in terms of our purpose to make a difference on this particular uh, planet Earth. Thank you so much. Um, 
Um, probably at this juncture, we might want to move over Salon. We might want to move over to uh, some questions. Uh, and I'll, I'm in a position to provide any answers to uh, some of your questions, if you do have any. Thank you so much. I hand over to Salon. Thank you so much, uh, Doc. Uh, it was such a powerful um, uh, session. And I can see uh, the chat box is amazing. So I'm allowing uh, people to uh, count on to unmute and also uh, ask your question. So yes, Doc can also uh, respond. Over to you, count on. Thank you, am I audible? Yes, count on, you are loud and clear. Okay, uh, I, wanted, I wanted to ask the doc that, uh, about uh, education cost 5.0. Uh, uh, looking at the other developed countries that uh, we intend to be competing with, they have sort of larger budgets for education. Uh, so I wanted to ask if our nation is, uh, is developed into the same through the education system, has increased its budget in, the, in terms of investing in the education system. Yes, can we have a three set, um, a set of three questions uh, at a time? So I've noted yours, Carlton. Let's have the next one. Yes, uh, Modesta, please uh, go ahead. I've asked you to unmute. Um, I wanted to ask how we can join the uh, master class, the one he was talking about. Thank you, uh, Modesta. Anyone else again with a pending question? Um, Doc, seems like there's no more questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yes, Carlton. Your question is very, very pertinent and important. Um, that of um, the budget, whether we do have a budget to support this um, a new education model. I wouldn't want to uh, uh, respond on behalf of, of government because I am not a government official. Uh, but I, I must just reiterate that your point is very relevant, very critical. If we are going to make a difference with uh, this heritage-based education 5.0 model, we will definitely need um, a, a budget which is significant enough to support its implementation because it's not, it's not just um, a minor thing. It's profound in terms of its transformation and therefore it will also call for a, a significant budget. But that budget should not just come from government. It should come also from private sector. And, and I want to acknowledge the role that um, Higher Life Foundation is already playing by bringing me here to talk about this model. It's a form of investment that Higher Life Foundation is, is actually doing into this particular a model. So if we could have more other players who come in board uh, to do the same and uh, or in many other different uh, uh, ways uh, contribute to the uh, mainstreaming of this particular model, then obviously Africa will move forward and, and uh, Zimbabwe in particular will, will be the, the champion uh, because the, the product started from here and is coming from Zimbabwe. So yes, I will not um, uh, venture into the issue of uh, uh, government budget uh, for, the, for the program though. Then Modesta is asking about how to join the uh, Education 5.0 uh, masterclass. 
Um, let me just say, uh, Pastor Jarimwa should be able to guide you going into the future because we, we are in some discussion on how this could be done. And unfortunately, I can't disclose any further details at this particular stage, but only to say uh, Pastor Jarim is handling this matter together with uh, uh, myself as two organizations. So further information will be brought uh, to you on, on how to go about it. Uh, unless um, Pastor Jarimwa, you are in a position to add more information, please say. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Doc. At the moment, I will say to our dynamites here, keep your eyes open on our WhatsApp groups. Once we have something solid to share with you, we are going to bring it on your platforms and we are going to look for applications. I think that's what I can say for now, because we want people who are serious, who are ready to become blue ocean digital thinkers, blue ocean digital leaders. So we will be calling out for applications and uh, keep your, your eyes open uh, on our WhatsApp, on our WhatsApp groups. Just keep watching our, our WhatsApp groups. Then Doc, maybe as we come to an end, um, you talked about something that is very important mm -hmm. that um, um, Africa's youth needs to come together in a prolific way as far as innovation and invasion is concerned in the, in the knowledge economy. And we have seen that over the years, it's something that uh, we have not been really aware of. I mean, this is new information and this is new knowledge you are bringing us. From the time I was in school in the 90s, uh, some of these young people were not born were well on this platform. I think we have only had one curriculum change that I can actually point to, which is recently, less than 10 years ago. But all of these years, I was using my brothers, my sisters' uh, material, which they did, which they used notes, which they wrote in the early 90s. And in 1999, I was using the same uh, material to write my, my, my grade seven. And so far, we've just had one curriculum change in, uh, in, in our nation. So that shows how we are lagging behind and lack of responsiveness, not only on the part of uh, the ministry that is responsible for, uh, for ensuring that we get this superior knowledge that we require, but also on us as young people. There is no demand, there is no responsiveness from us as young people, as we watch other nations progress and uh, make headway, we are content with where we are. So you have also, you are talking to, let me just classify us as that group. You are talking to that group that is not responsive enough, that is not eager enough, that is not hungry enough to use young people's message, that is not, you know, are thirst enough to want to find more information and to want change for ourselves. And you have given us this challenge to say, if we are going to realize the progress and the development that we need, we need to be able to have that digital mind shifting through lifelong uh, learning. And you've talked about those platforms. Before we talk about what our communities can do, before we talk about what the government can do, before we talk about what funders can do, because Africa uh, has that tendency of waiting for, fund, for funders to introduce new things and the like. What do we need to do? I know you have touched on some of these things. What do we need to do as young people and as youth for us to, to prepare ourselves for this digital mind shifting with what we have at the moment. We know that resources are a challenge, but what can we do as young people to prepare ourselves for that? You know, coming from a personal motivation level to 
the actions, the kind of uh, thinking, you know, thinking about how we think about things, you know, uh, uh, metacognition is that what they call it. So what can we start doing in our small little ways, given the community that we are coming from, the context that I've given, the challenges that we are facing in as far as the resources are concerned. Uh, what would be your take on that talk? Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Jarim. Um, yeah, it's a, um, your, your question is quite deep and uh, brings into uh, question quite a lot of issues and perspectives that would need to be touched on. Uh, first and foremost, it pains really to say uh, there's been very little movement in terms of uh, curriculum uh, changes and transformation um, since before independence, I should say. Yeah. Uh, a, a, a quite little changed during uh, independence. Yeah, and, and basically it was cosmetic and touching on very few, uh, probably what I would call trivial issues, which had nothing to do with uh, uh, capacitating the so-called independent individual uh, for uh, uh, economic independence. Because remember, the whole struggle that we are looking at is to do with economic independence, but it's also to do with improving the quality of life of our people. So if we don't change our curriculum, we should never expect a change in the quality of our, our livelihoods because it's dependent on the, the knowledge that we have and the solutions that we have to our problems. So uh, for instance, if uh, uh, every morning I'm driving along uh, the, the streets and I see a, a number of potholes, all what I see is how potholed our education system is. Mm -hmm. If you see raw sewage flowing uh, along the streets from homes, it shows how uh, ill capacitated our system is uh, from the mm -hmm. education perspective, because it is one that equips every individual, every professional to go out mm -hmm. there and be able to solve the problem. So clearly, if uh, in the 1980s, we had a small population of 4,000 vehicles in Harare, and mm -hmm. today we have several uh, thousands or if not millions of vehicles, uh, we can't still expect that the solutions that we were pro provided during the 1980s to solve potholes uh, still yeah. apply today. Uh, no. Things don't add up. And, <clears throat> and uh, that's, that's our issue. And this applies now to every industry sector. If you are looking at food security, it's the same issue. If you are looking at our healthcare, it's the same e issue. If you are looking at industry productivity itself, is the same issue. Uh, the people who are produced um, by our systems are pretty much prepared to manage and never to innovate and invent superior products and services. No, this, the system doesn't prepare anybody for that. Now, uh, we are also uh, saying um, uh, we have fallen prey to a particular syndrome. And this is what we call the yellow paper syndrome, where we have got lecturers who regurgitate knowledge, which they themselves received from their former lecturer, who in turn received that knowledge from their own uh, uh, lecturers. It's passed on from one generation to the other. And if you look at the notes, that the lecturers and some of the professors do hold when they come to, to the, to the uh, lecture theater. It's on a yellow paper. Why yellow? <laughs> because because uh, during the 80s, they were using yellow chalk, chalkboard. Yeah. And, uh, and they intended to paint the, the paper. And it has yeah. been passed on from one 
lecturer to the other. And that's disastrous. It's actually toxic for mm. the young mind uh, of the 21st century. Then the second challenge which comes with that is, um, is what we call uh, inbreeding. Uh, that inbreeding is where under normal circumstances, if you go to futuristic uh, universities, they've got what they call the faculty balance or balancing ratio, where they say 60% uh, is local, but 40% should be foreign. Mm. Uh, and the, but uh, here is 100% local. Mm. And when you have all 100% being local, what it means is that uh, you are promoting uh, inbreeding. And inbreeding is uh, uh, close to incest. And uh, when there is incest, uh, you know that uh, uh, some recessive diseases tend to emerge. And if that happens in the academic sector where it becomes incestuous, it, it means the product that we produce from our higher education system is totally defective, unable to solve their own problems at their own local uh, situation. And that's disastrous. Because this is the individual who is supposed to be capacitated to produce complex solutions at global level, to capacitate and build uh, competitive advantages for the world. How then can this young man, young lady be prepared enough to handle global problems when, when if, you, if you go elsewhere, their education system is way, way advanced, is ahead by far. It, it becomes problematic. So these are the issues that we need to, to look at. And I must also say, uh, the challenge is not just for the government. <laughs> It's for everyone, every citizen, mm. uh, including the young people. I liked what you raised uh, uh, and said, uh, we don't have the appetite for transformation. Mm. Uh, we are looking at uh, yourself, looking at the environment that you, you are going through, the kind of content that you are learning and, and saying, uh, well, in university, I'm being able to acquire this kind of uh, basic knowledge. Yeah. But going out there, there is superior knowledge which is required. And <clears throat> where do I get it? Look for it. Have that hunger, that appetite to go out there and do research. Because there is massive amount of knowledge out there. Imagine if at my age, I managed to acquire all this information, not from my local university, <laughs> but uh, from my own appetite, looking for it. I discovered it. And here I am. And I'm saying, no, let's package also this information for others. If you and I were to uh, uh, join hands and do the same, how many mindsets are we going to impact and change? for the better of our, our society. So the challenge really uh, is uh, for, for every one of us, and not just government. Um, uh, yeah, because there are also some other myths which we need to, to deal with, demystify them. For instance, the issue of saying uh, education system is just meant for, for the government to be able to work on it. Mm. Government needs to be pushed in one way or the other. But not only that, but we, we need to collaborate with government to show them some areas and angles which they don't know. I must tell you that no minister uh, has complete knowledge about their domain as, as a minister of government. No. They mm. depend on technocrats. They right. depend on people who know, who do the research and give that knowledge to the ministers. Now, what, what only differs is whether the minister is, is uh, um, uh, probably open-minded or not. Those that are open-minded tend to get new knowledge and perspectives from their technocrats and from others, ordinary citizens like you and I, who can actually go and knock at the door of the minister's uh, office and say, I've got this uh, 
convinced it works. And, but obviously, I, I must warn you that you, do, you shouldn't try to steal a political limelight from them because they are there for political limelight. <laughs> yeah. So make sure that they get their political limelight. But you, you will have achieved your goal. So mm -hmm. teaming up uh, in particular areas as young people, focus on high-end value objectives and vision, rather than to focus on trivial issues where people spend a lot of hours and time just discussing minor issues on, on social media. And, and in some cases, just teaching and training each other valueless uh, habits, which mm. don't add any value to, to your name, uh, uh, so to speak, because you have a name to create, you have a legacy, to create before you leave this planet Earth. Um, so yeah, most of our people, uh, I've noticed, particularly young people, they spend their time on Instagram, they spend their time on Facebook, they spend their time on, on Twitter and uh, in pursuit of, uh, of likes and so on and so forth. But if you look at what is being liked there, it's of no consequence, it's valueless. So, why not cut yourself out and stand and say, we want to collaborate, create teams that can do research on artificial intelligence. Yeah, and let's focus on precision agriculture. Let's focus yeah. on uh, health tech. Let's focus on FinTech. Let's focus on those areas that will enable you to create your own business model. Those areas that will also help you to create new knowledge those areas that will also help you to create a future, a future for yourself and for other young people. And then you become a, a useful a citizen uh, in this part of the world. And, and obviously that's what we want. So yeah, there's so much that we can do a, a, a past. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much. I feel like going on and on with this discussion, but because of time, Doc, we just want to say thank you very much for availing yourself for these past two days. And I know that you had to come from a family event to make sure that you are with us here. That's how important this um, discussion and empowering people is to you. And we just want to respect you and to say thank you. Thank you for honoring us to leave your family in the time that they are in to come here and be with us. We do appreciate. Thank you very much, Doc. We are looking forward for the master classes and we are looking forward to learn from you. Allow us to steal the term blue digital, blue, blue ocean uh, digital thinkers. We are stealing that and you will see it on our t-shirts somewhere, somehow. <laughs> Fantastic. I love that one. You are most welcome, <laughs> Pastor. Thank you very much. And then to everyone who is here tonight, we are coming to an end of our Lift Up Africa campaign that we have been running the 90 days. So we are looking forward to have Mrs. M come through. And uh, oh, Mrs. M has ministered to us in the morning. This evening, we are looking forward to have Bishop Mparuta speak to us and Dr. Msasiwa speak to us tonight. So make sure that you are connected at 8.15 and hear the man of God speak to us. Today's session also marks the end of our Lift Up Africa series on young and dynamic. Next week, we'll be starting something and you want to be part and parcel of it. Our governors are coming and they are coming with fire, with vibe, and they are coming with also information of what we need to do for the rest of the year. Thank you very much for connecting. See you tonight at 8.15 p.m. on our Global Intercessors platform. And also see you on Saturday next week, 3.45, as our governors take through the next half of the year. Thank you very much and goodbye to everyone. Have a lovely Saturday.